So today we're going to be talking about neurologic emergencies and behavioral emergencies. And I can't believe that Wade still uses the PowerPoint presentation straight from the book. So we're going to skip a lot of slides as we're kind of going through. I like to incorporate you guys into my teaching. So a lot of this is going to be based off of you guys today. So I'm expecting some discussion from you guys. Be honest, who's read this chapter? Okay. It helps a lot when you come to class with the chapter already read. Think of this as like a college course where you come to class with the chapter read and then you discuss at, in class. So we can really kind of get through uh, some of the key points that you guys are unsure of. But uh, neurologic emergency, so essentially strokes, seizures, syncope, that kind of thing. Um, so I'm going to be kind of like reading through these and then probably summarizing every few slides real quick. So bear with me on a as far as what we're going to go through. So uh, the anatomy of neurology. So we're going to talk about decreased level of responsiveness, seizures, stroke. What does decreased level of responsiveness look like? How are we going to determine that with somebody? Yeah. So like, how, how do you assess level of consciousness? OK, but even before that, like when you're GCS, when you walk in, yeah, the AVPU, remember that, where you walk in, are they alert to my presence? If they're not alert, are they responding to me verbally? And at that point, moving into painful stimuli, something like that, really as simple as that. And if they are not at that level where they're tracking you as you walk in the room, they have a decreased level of consciousness, okay? Um, so that's what they mean by that. We're gonna talk a little bit about headaches as well, just like when to be worried about a headache as opposed to, you know, is it like a simple tension headache or is it some sort of brain bleed or something more serious going on? So stroke, it's the fifth leading cause of death, leading cause of adult disability in the United States. We go on strokes a lot in EMS. So this is a call you're, you're going to see a lot. We can't, there's not a lot that we're going to do about these patients. In, in all reality, it's about recognition and when you see it, realizing that you need to get moving to the hospital. When you're going through your inner EMT, it's not necessarily something that's going to present as like a life threat necessarily in your ABCs or your primary assessment. But when you recognize that they're having a stroke and in real life, it's a lot easier to walk in and see someone like slumped over to one side. Uh, that's something you need to recognize quickly and get them moving to the hospital. Okay. Uh, and then seizures. So seizures are more of a neurological issue. They can recur, occur as a result of a lot of different things, such as a prior head injury. Why would that cause a seizure? Blood clot, active bleeding in the brain, uh, maybe they have some neurological damage from that fall. Things like brain tumors, metabolic problems, fever, more so in kids. So say like six and under has a new onset of a seizure. We're going to think more of a febrile seizure. We'll go over this a lot more here. This is just kind of a general overview. And then genetic disposition. That's kind of probably the majority of seizure calls we go on. Epilepsy. Has anybody uh, ever seen a seizure in real life? Yeah, so there, if you've seen it, you know what it looks like. It can be kind of scary if you're not really sure what to do. Most of the time, we don't do a whole lot for those either. We're going to kind of keep them on their side, give them a little oxygen, keep their airway clear, and kind of transport. But uh, so yeah, we're going to talk about stroke, seizures, and then other possible causes of altered mental status. And we're going to get into a lot of these here. This is just kind of an overview for right now. So starting off with some anatomy and physiology review. So the brain is the body's computer, controls our breathing, speech, and all body functions. What specific part of our brain controls our breathing? What's like the most important primal part of our brain? Brain stem, okay. Where is it located? Kind of right in the back, lower half of our brain, lower section of our brain. That's the most important part of the brain. And so, they, yeah, someone mentioned it. Where does that brain stem in the spinal cord enter and exit the skull? the foramen magnum, okay? So when we have things like herniation of our brain or where our brain swells, that's where that brainstem gets compressed on that foramen magnum, and that's what causes uh, difficulty with breathing and a level of consciousness. So the three major parts of the brain being the brainstem, the cerebellum, the cerebrum. I don't expect you guys to know the different parts of the brain and what affects what all that much. They go into it a little bit, but uh, not something that we really expect you to know. The cerebrum's the biggest part. The brainstem controls breathing. That's about as much as you need. We're not neurologists here, right? We don't need to know 
all the different parts of the brain. So as you can see, brain stem, well protected, but all of that pressure anywhere, if there's bleeding in that brain, it's gonna start pushing that brain stem down into that foramen magnum where that spinal cord comes out, okay? Anybody can tell me what the Cushing's triad is? Uh, it's gonna be, I wanna say. Anybody besides this guy? Or that guy, he did his homework already. You, what's the Cushing's triad? It's a different triad. Oh, that's Beck's triad. Never mind. I don't got it. Okay. Um, so. Isn't it, isn't it, uh, it's an increased heart rate, low blood pressure. Or you got it backwards. High blood pressure with a low heart rate. And it'll be like weekend 30, but I can't remember the third. So irregular or absent respirations. So you think of the brain stem. It's what Cushing's triad is that brain stem being compressed, right? And so we're going to get hypertension, so high blood pressure, because what your body does when you get swelling in your brain is it constricts all your blood vessels. And when you constrict your blood vessels and you think about what is blood pressure, right? And you have systemic vascular resistance. When your blood pressure, blood vessels constrict, that's going to increase your blood pressure. And then what is happening is your increased blood pressure, your body's trying to maintain homeostasis. So it decreases your heart rate. And so, and then the direct compression of the brainstem is what's gonna basically stop your breathing or give you irregular respiration. So that's what is the cause of the Cushing's triad. Um, so that's, that is a big testing question, the Cushing's triad that will be on your national registry, that will be on this test that you're gonna take for sure. Uh, so it's something to be aware of that Cushing's triad for sure gonna be on there. And it is a real thing that you see in the field. I remember the first time I saw it, the guy had a, uh, spontaneous head bleed, like worst headache of his life, unconscious in like five minutes. We walked in, I think his pressure was 240 over 120, heart rate of 40, and he was breathing with the Shane Stokes respirations, that really irregular kind of respiratory rate. Um, yeah, it was, it was a cool call, but not for him. Uh, one of those. I uh, don't really care about that too much. Let's see. Why do we not care about the left and right side effects? If you want to know, like specifically, if something happens on the left side, it's probably going to affect the right side more. If it's something that happens on the right side, it's going to affect the left side more. That's about the extent that you're going to. But there's also research that shows it. It's just very vague. There's not a whole lot that's like really cut and dry with neurological emergencies. So to sit here and be like, well, if it's this artery on this side, and it's going to affect, you're not going to remember that anyways when you get out into the field. But you really need to know is kind of what's going to affect your ABCs and what we really need to know to see in the field to get them kind of moving towards the hospital. And yeah, there's, there might be a question of if you see deficits on the left side, what side of the brain is it affecting? It's usually the opposite side. Um, in this one, they talk about, you know, the left side speech is controlled on the left, but I've seen plenty of strokes where they had some sort of left sided brain bleed or brain, uh, ischemic clot and they had uh, other issues that were supposed to be from the right side of the brain. So it just, it's so dependent okay. on these types of things. It's hard to really teach specifics, if that makes sense. So as far as some more anatomy, the spinal cord, um, essentially it's protected by the spine and at every vertebrae, it kind of branches out from the spine. And uh, we have I'm trying to think of what the name is down here. I used to know it. I should know this. There's a group of nerves down in your lumbar spine, the cauda equina is what it's called. And what that is, and it, this could be something you'll see on a test, is it's basically a reflex arc. So when there's, instead of going all the way up to your brain, so those reflexes, when you touch something that's really hot and you have an automatic response to pull away, uh, these are called reflex arcs in your spinal cord. And so what it is, is it, it's a way for the impulse is not to go all the way up to your brain and back down and receive that impulse. It goes right to the, the central of the spinal cord and back out. And it's called a reed. It's what we get the name reflex from. It's a reflex arc. 
but enough anatomy and physiology. Uh, the brain is very sensitive to oxygen, glucose, and temperature. That's important. Oxygen, glucose, and temperature. So with that in mind, I mean, you can almost look at this one slide and be like, how do we assess someone with a neurological emergency, somebody with altered mental status? What are three things that we should get on every single patient with altered mental status or some sort of stroke-like presentation? So oxygen, get a glucose on them and get a temperature on them, okay? Every single neurological emergency you're gonna go on, we need to assess their oxygen status, their SpO2, and give them oxygen if needed. Assess their blood glucose and give them, blood, uh, give them glucose if needed. And then assess their temperature to see if they're hypothermic or hyperthermic, okay? Very important, that's something that is very that's going to be driven into you from now until the time you're out in the field. Uh, neurological stroke, seizure type patients. We're always going to get, you know, their oxygen status, give them oxygen if needed, get their blood glucose, which is, it sounds like something really easy to do, but in the, in the scheme of things gets lost pretty often. Getting a blood glucose and then assessing their temperature. What's a normal blood glucose? 80 to 120. 80 to 120, 70 to 110, depending on what your text, what textbooks you're reading. I'm not sure what your guys' says exactly. Um, they, they tend to come out with a couple different ranges over every few years. So yeah, uh, checking the blood sugar, checking their oxygen, checking their temperature on every single neurological emergency. Seizure, stroke, syncope, altered mental status. Does anybody know what syncope is? Fainting. Fainting. Okay. Yeah, we're going to go into it later. But So let's start off with headaches. Uh, believe it or not, you go on a lot of headaches in pre-hospital settings and yeah, 90% of them are nothing. Or they're a migraine, we may treat it, you know, at the paramedic level, may treat it with pain meds, maybe not. Uh, it's a very common complaint, but the reason we're worried about it is it can be a symptom or condition of any, of another neurological condition. Things like strokes, brain bleeds, so um, subarachnoids, epidural, uh, subdural type brain bleeds. There's three different kinds, and I believe we, you probably went over them in your trauma section, yeah. So uh, brain bleeds being probably the biggest thing we're worried about. Generally on the medical side of things, we're thinking, you know, subarachnoid bleed, something like that, uh, because subdural and epidural are typically caused by trauma, uh, whereas the subarachnoid can be caused by things like high blood pressure. So that's something that we, that's why uh, high blood pressure is such a big issue is for the stroke side of things. Only a small percentage of headaches are caused by serious medical conditions, but it's something that we need to be uh, aware of. So starting off with tension headaches, essentially just sore tight muscles, right? Not something that we're gonna spend much time on worrying about. Uh, attributed to stress, usually a squeezing, dull, aching, kind of a longer onset. It's usually not like a sudden onset. We have migraine headaches. Anybody have migraines in here? Anybody, yeah, they're, they can be debilitating. Um, yeah. Uh, thought to be caused by changes in blood vessel size, but they don't really know a lot of the times why they're caused. Uh, usually described as pounding, throbbing, pulsating, um, can often be associated with nausea, vomiting. So if you have that patient with that pounding, intense headache that's nausea, vomiting, what does that sound like to you? Think back to your trauma chapter. Sounds like a head injury patient, right? So when you're thinking about these kinds of calls, they're kind of like head injury patients, our neurological emergencies. They have increased ICP, they're gonna have those headaches, nausea, vomiting, decreased level of consciousness potentially. Those are the big kind of warning signs that we need to worry about when they start, uh, when, they're alter when their mental status starts to change, when their vitals really start to change, that really high blood pressure, um, if they're starting to have a lot of na uncontrolled nausea with it, nausea, vomiting with it. Uh, those are when we start to really worry a little bit, or a lot, depending on how. Sinus headaches, again, not really something that we're gonna be, a, we're gonna be treating at all, but just something to be aware of. Everybody kind of probably has one of those at some point, really that pressure on their sinuses. That's why it's a sinus headache. Uh, it's a, few, a fluid accumulation in the sinus cavities. Let's see, there were, used to be a, nice table in your book that said like red flags for 
Does anybody have their book open? This is like a table that says like all the different things to worry about with the headache. Okay, what what is that uh, table? 18-1. 18 18-1 18 on page. Page 727. On page 727. So something to keep in mind. If you want to keep one thing in mind about headaches, that's probably the table you need to know. Essentially, if it's a really sudden onset, the worst headache of their life, if they're over 55, take it a lot more seriously. Um, altered mental status. Uh, pupillary changes are going to be a big deal if you see anything like that, <clears throat> which that can happen with migraines, but we have to assume the worst. Um, so pupillary changes. If they have a really stiff neck associated with it, why would that be? What would be worried about? What's up? Uh, if there's trauma associated with it, sure, but say in a medical setting. Uh, potentially more like meningitis. Think meningitis, especially in like the teenage population. If they have a really stiff neck associated with a really bad headache and altered mental status. Now, a lot of people are going to get that kind of neck tension like you would with a tension headache, but we're talking very like severe neck pain with no associated trauma with that headache. Uh, that's what we're going to start to con get concerned. And a lot of times with meningitis, we'll have a fever because it's bacterial or viral. So uh, if it's very high fever and you're thinking more bacterial, that's a big deal. Uh, protect yourselves, mask, goggles, gown, the works if you are suspecting bacterial meningitis. All right, moving on to strokes. So strokes, also known as a cerebral vascular accident or CVA. And this is an interruption of blood flow to the brain, either via an ischemic or blood clot or hemorrhagic stroke. Hemorrhagic being where basically a blood vessel bursts. Either way, you're thinking of that end organ perfusion, that brain, and there's some sort of blockage. Either it's a clot or it's burst open and it's just bleeding into their brain, their, the cavity. So ischemic or hemorrhagic. Ischemic is a lot more common, probably 80 plus percent of strokes are ischemic strokes. And hemorrhagic strokes accounting for the rest. Uh, hemorrhagic strokes have a much higher mortality rate. I would say the vast majority of hemorrhagic strokes I've had, and I've had a lot over my career, the patients are either at least altered mental status, if not completely unconscious, seizing, that kind of thing. They're going to be, their, their level of consciousness will be altered at some point if it continues to bleed. Uh, usually the ones that are still with it, it's because it just happened and you're, or it's a smaller vessel. So uh, hemorrhagic, while it's a lot less common, those are the wild ones. Those are like the ones you show up and you're going to be doing a lot of stuff, having to deal with seizures, having to deal with you know, advanced airway maneuvers, um, an unconscious type of patient. So that's something to be aware of. Those, you're going to have a lot more things to do with those hemorrhagic strokes as opposed to the ischemic where it's more of recognizing it, recognizing what's happening and getting them to the hospital. Ischemic strokes, 87% of strokes uh, results from thrombosis or embolus. What's the difference between the two? Nope. So thrombosis being a blood clot and embolus being, it could be something like fatty tissue, uh, air, air embolus. So somebody that has an open neck wound can have a stroke. Uh, pregnant patients, pregnant females, really at risk for fat embolus strokes or somebody that's had a recent surgery, they're gonna be really at high risk for uh, throwing a blood clot or also throwing uh, fat emboli from that surgery site. So uh, pregnant, obviously pregnant females. Uh, pregnancies, recent surgeries, females with uh, uh, birth control, on birth control, higher risk for strokes, as well as smokers. Okay, those are the kind of be your patient population that are gonna be really high risk for stroke. And then uh, atherosclerosis, I can never say this, atherosclerosis in the blood vessels is often a cause. Have you guys gone over cardiac yet? Cardiac emergencies? Yeah. So similar, like atherosclerosis, see? Uh, plaque in your vessels. I, can't, I don't know why for years I've never been able to say that word. <clears throat> plaque buildup in your vessels. Same thing when your heart, that, that leads you to be very susceptible to AMIs is that plaque buildup in your blood vessels in your brain gonna leave you a lot more susceptible to stroke. 
essentially that's just showing, you know, the bigger the vessel, the more brain tissue is going to be affected. So if we had a tiny little clot in this section of your of the blood vessel, there's only going to be just a little bit of brain tissue affected. But if you have a clot in one of these bigger vessels, a lot more of your brain is going to be uh, <clears throat> going to be affected. So strokes can present in so many different ways. We have our basics down of how we're going to assess for them, but just know that they can really present with, you know, very mild speech difficulty or mild confusion and balance issues all the way up to the classic flaccidity to one side, facial droop, not able to speak. So there can be a wide range of these presentations. That's why I think neurological emergencies they took me the longest time. It took me years to really under kind of understand neurological emergencies because there's so many little nuances to this. So we're gonna try to teach you guys the basics and it's gonna take a lot of experience for you guys to go out and really un like understand anything besides the classic stroke for a while. So just keep that in mind. This does take some time to really, uh, this could be a whole semester class on neurological stuff. We're just teaching you guys the very basics right now. Hemorrhagic strokes, 13% um, of strokes, often fatal. Uh, people at risk include those experiencing stress or exertion. Anybody here like ever moved a hot tub? Yeah. I've been on I had four or five calls of the hot tub mover guys have a, some sort of stroke or something like that. Uh, I would just say avoid that whole profession of moving super heavy stuff because they're exerting themselves super hard. And these are people that usually in their 40s or younger and have some sort of stroke because of that exertion. Um, people at high risk are those with very high blood pressure. Anybody here take their blood pressure on a regular basis? Is it pretty good? See, this is at, at risk right there. Okay, that's why it's super important. That's why they worry about that so much is that shearing force, not only on the vasculature of your heart, but the vasculature in your brain. So high blood pressure, something important to keep an eye on. I really encourage you guys, even if you think you have good blood pressure, it's like my plug. Check your blood pressure regularly. Uh, keep an eye on it. <clears throat> Another thing that uh, we're not really going to recognize in the field, uh, but a cause of hemorrhagic stroke is a brain aneurysm. It's really just a weakening of a blood vessel. And it kind of creates this pouch that may or may not, and I think they just added color to this. What, they, what this would be is just like this engorged pouch that's just ready to pop. And so it's called an aneurysm. We can get them in our thoracic vessels as well as our blood vessels. And what that is is just a weakening of the artery. And then at any point, that's going to uh, pop. And that's going to be a hemorrhagic stroke. So uh, kind of the classic joke of don't you know, cause an aneurysm. It's, it's due to that high blood pressure generally or exerting yourself from a defect or a weakening of the ar arterial wall. TIA. Um, so a TIA, this is really difficult. This is like, sometimes they'll happen right in front of you. I've had calls where uh, I've had a patient present with full stroke-like symptoms where they were unable to move. They were like tracking me, but unable to talk, unable to move, uh, unable to really communicate with us at all. I got this lady to the hospital. By the time I was at the hospital, she looked up at me and said, did I just have a stroke? And she was able to move her arms. Um, so that resolved right in front of me, but a lot of times what these are is it's stroke-like symptoms that go away in less than 24 hours. So if you show up and say a patient said, I had left-sided deficits, my face was drooping on my left side, and I couldn't talk, but you show up and you don't see any stroke-like symptoms, how are you going to treat that patient? Like a stroke, good. Because TIAs are essentially a warning sign for a larger stroke to come. Doesn't mean it's going to happen in the next day. But generally within the next couple weeks, it's kind of a warning sign. It's essentially, so when you talked about cardiac emergencies, thinking of angina versus an actual heart attack where angina gets better with uh, rest. This is kind of like angina of a stroke, right? It means your blood vessels are narrowed. You have plaque buildup and you're getting ready to have that, the big one, right? You're getting ready to have that stroke. Um, so TIAs are really a warning sign of an impending stroke. So if you have a patient that you show up and they don't have the stroke-like symptoms anymore, but they were complaining of them, we're still gonna take them into the hospital as if they were having a stroke, okay? 
or they may be having the full stroke-like symptoms. You get to the hospital and it's resolved by the time they get to the CT scanner or they, you know, they scan them and they don't find anything. They're still going to treat that like a stroke because it's still a TIA at that point. So a lot of times you're not going to know until it could potentially be too late if it's a TIA or not. So signs and symptoms of a stroke. You, it, this is, I mean, I bet most of you guys knew this before you probably even started this class. Uh, facial droop, sudden weakness or numbness in the face, arm, leg, or one, on, I think I should say on one side of the body. Decreased or absent movement and sensation on one side of the body, also known as flaccidity. You'll hear that term quite a bit. Uh, so usually, especially with ischemic strokes, unilateral or one-sided. It's not that general like, oh, I just feel so weak and tired, I can't move. Strokes are going to be one side or the other the vast, vast majority of the time, especially with ischemic strokes. Those hemorrhagic strokes, it's going to affect your level of consciousness and your mental status a lot more. But the ischemic strokes is going to be unilateral the vast majority of the time. Lack of muscle coordination or ataxia and loss of balance. This doesn't mean everybody that's dizzy and can't walk very well is having a stroke, but there's a small percentage that really actually are. So something to keep in mind. Sudden vision loss. See, this is where it gets kind of into, this is tough because there's a lot of signs and symptoms that could be a stroke. The big ones are going to be this first slide here, facial droop, unilateral weakness or numbness, or complete flaccidity of one side, and then basically slurred speech or inability to speak. What's the inability to speak called medical terminology wise? So dysphagia is difficulty speaking. Inability to speak is aphasia. So that's going to be really important. Those are terms you should know, especially for relaying it to the hospital. Aphasia, inability to speak. Dysphagia, difficulty speaking. Uh, with the G or the S? So the G is, with, is for eating, yeah, okay. and the S is for speech. You get into a lot of these. You know, difficulty swallowing, blurred and double vision. Those are your cranial nerves. So if there's different cranial nerves affected by the stroke, they're going to cause different minor types of issues. I'm more concerned that you guys know the, you know, the facial droop, the unilateral weakness and deficits, the uh, decreased mental status, the things that are going to really affect your ABCs. Okay, yeah, so strokes in the left cerebral hemisphere can cause aphasia more often than the right side. Um, if it's in the left side, it's going to cause that paralysis to the right side more often. So essentially, like we were talking about earlier, left side is going to cause right-sided unilateral. Right side is going to cause left-sided unilateral deficits. Speech problems more often in the left cerebral hemisphere. Another thing you might see in uh, patients, this is saying with right hemisphere issues, but it, it's just a general thing. We're, we're not going to necessarily know right versus left in the field. This is kind of with the information they may get in the hospital, but neglect. So neglect is if you were to walk up to me and I was your patient and you walked up to me over here, I would totally not even act like I knew you were there until you walked into my vision. Okay. They're going to neglect one side or the other. So neglect is a sign of a major occlusive stroke. So if you were to walk in, so what I do when I walk up to a stroke patient is I will walk up to them and I'll stand right in front of them. And so that way I can see any facial droop, any pupillary changes, any unilateral deficits. And then usually when I'm having my conversation, I'll kind of walk to one side, kind of walk to the other, see if they're tracking me just the same on both sides. It's just an easy way that you can kind of see if your patient has any sort of neglect. Um, just a sign. You should, it's something you'll just kind of pick up on over time as you see the patients, if they're kind of slouched off to one side or they're looking off. A lot of times it's very obvious. They're looking to one side. They're just sitting here. They may even be talking to you in front of them, but they're going to look off to this side or look off to the other side. That's neglect. That's a sign of a, a major occlusive stroke. And now bleeding in the brain, so kind of the hemorrhagic side, some signs and symptoms. So high blood pressure, 
So that may be the cause of the bleeding, kind of the chicken or the egg, or may be caused by the bleeding. So thinking of that Cushing's triad, uh, it's our compensatory response. So we're talking blood pressures, you know, generally 180 or higher. Typically, I don't really think of high blood pressure being that high until I see like 180. Uh, after that, I start to get concerned a little bit. If I see it over 200, then I'm like, okay, yeah, like there's something going on for sure. That's kind of my, my threshold. Um, and then significant drops in blood pressure may occur as a patient's condition worsens. They're just not able to compensate anymore. Essentially, think of it kind of like shock. Uh, you have that high blood pressure, high blood pressure, high blood pressure. And then if you see that precipitous drop in their blood pressure, then you're going to get ready for a code. They're going to they're gonna code on you. They're going to stop breathing. So um, just something to be aware of. If you, they have high blood pressures and then have that really large drop in blood pressure, they're decompensating at this point. Kind of like you would see in your, your major traumas, things like that. If you see that drop in blood pressure, uh, not a good sign. So conditions that can mimic a stroke, hypoglycemia is the number one mimic of a stroke. I want you guys to remember that going out into the field. Hypoglycemia is the number one mimic of a stroke. So get a blood sugar early before you call the hospital because they're going to ask you what the blood sugar is. Get a blood sugar with your initial set of vitals on any neurological patient. Remember the brain needs oxygen, glucose, and adequate temperature. Uh, get a blood sugar. So low blood sugar is going to be uh, the number one mimic of a stroke. So can you have a stroke and low blood sugar at the same time? Absolutely. Uh, so you're still going to treat them as if, if they have stroke-like symptoms and you're kind of treating the, and they have low blood sugar at the same time, we're still treating it as a stroke as we're raising their blood sugar up. Okay, you can always cancel that code stroke to the hospital, but what you don't want to do is show up to the hospital with a guy with stroke-like symptoms and then now a normal blood sugar with still stroke-like symptoms and you didn't call it a stroke, right? That would be poor form. So if you have a patient with low blood sugar and stroke-like symptoms, we're gonna treat that blood sugar in route to the hospital as a code stroke. And then if their symptoms go away after you raise their blood sugar, we can cancel the stroke. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, that's a big one. That's kind of a scenario you'll hear about a lot. Had it a couple times. It's not very common, but it, you'll see it for sure. Uh, I think the one that I had, we raised her blood sugar. She was still having a stroke, so it's not like it changed anything. But I've definitely seen low blood sugar present as a stroke, and we raised their blood sugar real quick, and their symptoms went away. So, postictal state. This one can be a really tough one, especially starting out when you're like trying to figure out all the different causes of altered mental status. What is a postictal state? From what? From having a stroke. Not a stroke, a seizure. Sorry. So a postictal state is going to be after a seizure. So a lot of times the big clues that this is a seizure and not a stroke is their history for sure. So one of the first things you need to ask is, well one, are they actively seizing as you walk in, right? But two, do they have a history of seizures? Um, is, are they, have they had a seizure before? <coughs> Other signs of a postictal state, have they urinated themselves? Pretty common. Um, you're not gonna really see the unilateral deficits that you're gonna see in an ischemic stroke. You're gonna see just altered mental status and maybe you know altered level of consciousness and they're just gonna be not really making very much sense. Maybe even slurred speech, you could call it. It's just more of nonsensical words. Uh, has anybody seen, you guys have seen seizures. Have you seen the postictal state? Yep. So he just supported the head and make sure he didn't hit the wall that he was right next to. Yeah. And then, like, afterwards, he kind of just calmed down. And then, like, he was there. But it, it was kind of a special case because the kid had special needs. Mm -hmm. Severe autism where he couldn't, like, move or do anything. Yeah. And so it was, it was kind of interesting. Like, yeah, and it can take 30 minutes post-seizure, post-grand mal, I'm sorry, post-grand mal seizure to get back to their normal baseline. So uh, this is something that's really common that we'll see, but we're really still looking for that unilateral deficits, things like pupillary changes, signs of that increased ICP, right? So 
really high blood pressure, low heart rate, uh, if they have irregular respirations. That's what we're really concerned about for hemorrhagic stroke and then the ischemic stroke being the unilateral deficits, um, facial droop. Uh, how long would you consider like a bad seizure to last? I consider it a status epilepticus, so seizure that's not stopping. If I'm a 911 provider and I show up and they're still seizing, I consider that status. Because 90% of the time when we show up to a seizure call, they're done seizing. Uh, because usually it's one or two seizures, it takes a few minutes, it takes about nine to 10 minutes for EMS to show up. If they're still seizing when I show up, I consider it status. Um, you'll hear the definition of 30 minutes of continuous seizure activity with no break or return to mental status. And this is from, this is from the neuro doc at St. Luke's that he's, he's also on board. If you show up as EMS and they're still seizing, treat it as status. Uh, but the textbook definition is 30 minutes, I think, with uh, no return to baseline mental status and no break in the seizures. So then you transport them when you get there, if they're still seizing, you just transport? Yeah, at the basic level, what you're going to essentially do is roll them on their side, suction is needed, give them some oxygen. I give nasal cannulas, not non rebreathers, to my seizure patients because I don't want them to vomit into that mask and then just aspirate all that vomit. Um, so I'll do a nasal cannula, roll them on their side. It's tough as hell to get a blood pressure and all that from a patient that's still seizing, but uh, try to get a blood sugar, try to get a set of vitals, um, and then transport on their side, keeping in mind you're gonna probably need to suction that patient. You're probably gonna need to make sure that their airway's staying open potentially, and then watching their respiratory drive uh, to make sure if they're seizing long enough, they may not be breathing adequately, so you may have to assist their ventilations. which we're gonna go, I mean, this is right after strokes, we're gonna talk about seizures and treatment and all that, but. Uh, trauma to the head can also mimic strokes. Thinking of brain occupying lesions, so stuff like head bleeds, tumors, all that kind of stuff, that it can all mimic a stroke depending on where it's at. Um, so especially in your younger patients, patients without any medical history, always ask about that recent trauma um, and Usually what it is, it's a few days after, say, a car accident or after that patient fell. Who is most susceptible to subdural hematomas? There's two patient populations. Uh, pediatrics and older. Pediatrics and elderly. I was, yeah, so there's really three. I mean, the thing I worry about mostly is alcoholics and elderly. So those are the two highest risk for subdural hematomas. Um, because alcoholics, their brain atrophies. So there's a lot more space for that brain to bounce around in there, yeah. And then uh, geriatrics, same reason, their brain atrophies over time. So very common for those patient populations. They're, they may be altered all the time because they're drunk. 90, these are like your homeless patients, your patients with a lot of substance abuse that you go on every day. And then one time they're having a, you know, a stroke or something like that and you may be written them off because you've seen them 10 times, but if you kind of notice that, hey, their behavior seems a little bit different today, uh, those are the ones you really need to key yourself into those types of patients. Those are kind of our high risk to get burned on those patients. I've been burned by those patients before. Um, so really keep your, uh, keep your opinions out of all your calls and try to go in with an objective view because uh, they're sometimes our most sick population, some of those, you know, those low uh, socioeconomic status uh, patients. So, all right, seizures, officially going into the seizure kind of section. So seizures being a neurologic episode caused by a surge of electrical activity in the brain. Can take form of a convulsion. That's kind of the classic one you guys have probably all seen on TV or you've seen potentially in, in real life, that convulsive activity. Or it can be just associated with temporary alteration in consciousness. So you think of someone that's just sitting there and all of a sudden they slump over for a second and wake back up. Or they have some weird repetitive behavior. That can be a seizure as well. Generally not something that we're going to treat. We're more worried about the grand mal tonic-clonic seizure activity. Uh, so generalized seizures where it's the full body. So there's two basic groups being generalized and partial. A generalized seizure 
is electrical, abnormal electrical discharges from large areas of the brain, not just one portion, but bigger portions of the brain overall, typically characterized by unconsciousness and generalized severe twitching of all muscles that last several minutes. Pretty important, right? They're not going to be conscious. They're not talking to you through a seizure. If they're doing that, it's either a partial seizure or they're faking, which you do this long enough, you find out that's probably the biggest thing people will fake is a seizure. Uh, I don't know why. I stopped asking myself that question years ago. A lot of people fake them, but don't just assume they're faking it, right? There's a lot of people that have legitimate seizure histories and some of the other type, those partial seizures can present as some really weird uh, behavior. So a generalized seizure is going to be characterized by unconsciousness and generalized severe twitching. So tonic being that rigidity, that initial kind of like they'll seize up, and then clonic activity is kind of a rhythmic contraction, so that kind of that shaking like a fish that you kind of see in that seizure activity. So you'll hear this as generalized seizure, grand mal seizure, or tonic clonic. Those are kind of the three types of terms you'll hear for a generalized seizure. There's also absence seizure. These are going into your partial seizures. So absence seizure does not involve any motor activity, characterized by a brief lapse in consciousness where they will stare and not respond for a few minutes. Think of it almost as like a fainting episode. It looks just like a fainting episode, an absence seizure. This is a lot more common in kids. This is kind of the classic kid seizure presentation. The one that you're used to? Oh, yeah. That's just the one that I have, like, physically seen and stuff. Yeah. Isn't that just daydreaming? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one might think so. <laughs> uh, partial focal, they're going to be aware of what's going on for the most part. They're not going to have a decreased level of consciousness. They may have some twitching or brief paralysis in an arm. Generally have numbness, weakness, visual changes, unusual smells or tastes. Uh, going back to generalized seizures, uh, has anybody ever heard of the term aura? An aura? They may know that they're going to have a seizure. They, so a lot of times, I mean, I've been on a few calls where we go to like Blue Cross on Eagle and Fairview for a patient having a seizure or like some of these telemarketer places that have a lot of people that work there for a seizure in a parking lot. And I was like, why is everybody seized in a parking lot? Well, it's because a lot of patients know they're about to have a seizure. They don't want to be embarrassed at work. And so they'll go out into their car by themselves to have a seizure. Well, then someone sees them having one, calls us. Um, so they just know that they're about to have one. They either have a weird taste in their mouth. They may see bright spots of light. A lot of times they'll that, yeah, I think so. I, I'm not really well read into the uh, into that, but dogs can pick up on stuff like that. And so a lot of times they'll have their own uh, therapy dogs or whatever, service dogs, I guess, which they go, they can go in an ambulance. You can't ask why. Um, it, you can ask what the purpose of a, of a therapy or a service dog does, but that is it. So just so you know, that's a really, like you can get in a lot of trouble for <laughs> refusing somebody to bring their service dog and I, I've had service cats, I've had service birds, and it's just like, I digress, but yeah, it's, it's, an, it's a new thing that you cannot ask about any more questions other than what is the function of your service animal. Sorry, I can go off into all sorts of tangents all day, I'll try not to. <clears throat> Uh, things like lips, so back to partial focal seizures, things like lip smacking, eye blinking, isolated jerking. Sometimes I've seen them just repeat a phrase over and over, and it's really weird. Yeah, like that, exactly, uh, something like that. Uh, unpleasant smells, visual hallucinations, uncontrollable fear, repetitive physical behavior. Um, there can be a lot of presentations to these. Generally, not our concern of like airway, breathing, circulation. We're going to kind of just monitor them, wait for them to kind of stop. And it's kind of up to the patient on what they want to do in these situations, if they want to go to the hospital or not. When I was a new paramedic, if I went to a seizure, we're yarding them out while they're seizing, taking them to the hospital, no matter what, no questions asked, right? The longer you get doing this, the longer you think about like, is that really what's best for somebody with epilepsy to have a seizure every week and get hauled off to the hospital? So a lot of times now, if they're not, 
in ABC, yeah, we're going to be asking like, you know, is this normal for you? And it, we're going to, I think we might get into this in a minute, but as far as transporting a patient with a seizure, if it's not a threat to their ABCs and it's their routine seizure behavior, a lot of times family is going to know about it. Friends are going to know about it. The patient may be aware enough to talk to you after a few minutes. And I'll ask them, hey, you know, do you usually have one? To, you know, how many seizures do you usually have? Do you have more than one in a row? Is there anything different about today? And if it's all kind of the same, like routine for them, a lot of times I don't transport those patients. That doesn't mean I want you to go and be like, Mike Zinn told me I don't have to transport any seizure patients. Uh, I don't want to hear that. That's not uh, definitely going to be a national registry thing. That's just kind of field versus an REMT. Uh, but if there's anything unusual about the seizure, it's lasting longer than normal. If there's any trauma associated with the seizure that day, changes in meds, recent illnesses, things like that, I'm going to probably try to really transport that patient um, and really push for transport. If that makes sense. So, oh, kind of sorry. Like when they're all like rigid and stuff. Like yeah. So it, what it gets really tough is it can be easy if they're like say in a living room and we just put a sheet under them, put them on our bed and yard them out that way. What's tough is if they're in like a basement. If people, I mean, they call 911, they swear they get naked, they get wet, they crawl into a corner in like a closet and then they call us. So uh, it's just one of those, it's very dependent on where they're at. Uh, but yes, if they start seizing while you're moving them, if you can, just set them down because you're going to hurt yourself or you're going to hurt them trying to get them out of a situation. And for the most part, it's pretty rare that you're gonna, they're gonna be seizing so continuously that you can't even move them. A lot of times they'll have a seizure, there'll be a couple minutes to uh, where they're not seizing, they're kind of postictal, and then you'll have a, you know, two to three minutes to work before they start seizing again. So when I go on a patient that's still in status seizure, we'll let them seize. And then when they stop, we're gonna you know, start the IV, get the vitals, get a blood sugar, do all that kind of stuff. Put them on, I mean, we'll try to put on oxygen when they're seizing actively still, but other than that, we're trying to do everything in those like two to three minute windows. Let them seize again, move them, you know, things like that. Throw them on the bed or whatever the case may be when they're stopped seizing, because usually you have a couple minutes. If you have a, if you have a stairwell, then uh, you know, maybe let them stop seizing, move them down the stairwell, and then kind of re, not everything has to happen in like two minutes, right? You can take a little bit of time, especially when it comes to safety of yourself and the patient to assess the situation and kind of move them. Does that, does that make sense? Okay, what was your question? Uh, you okay. See, this is why, I mean, I went through these slides, but uh, they talk about the aura. They don't occur prior to every seizure, but a lot of people with seizure disorders do experience an aura. So generalized seizures, they typically last less than five minutes, followed by that postictal state. That postictal state can last 30 minutes. Sometimes it only lasts a couple minutes. Um, but the seizure itself generally lasts less than five minutes. Uh, absence, you, you might have heard the term petite mal. That's what they used to call them. But now it's just called an absence seizure. Usually they only last for a few seconds. There's no real postictal phase to these. Now, <clears throat> the one we are concerned about as EMS providers is going to be status epilepticus. So this is seizures lasting more than five minutes that are likely to progress to status epilepticus. Seizures that continue every few minutes without the person regaining consciousness or last longer than 30 minutes, that's considered a status epilepticus. So that's your textbook answer right there. If, if you guys are looking at like a test question, that's your textbook test question answer. Um, in the field, it's if you show up, especially if you're, you know, longer than, you know, especially that 10 minute time frame of 911 being called and they're still seizing when you walk in, they're in status epilepticus. So that's, uh, that's when you're going to want to start treating these patients. Some causes of seizures. We talked about a couple of them, but the number one being epileptic or congenital origin. Some structural causes, things like tumors, infections, head trauma, strokes can cause seizures. Why would a stroke cause a seizure? It's affecting the electrode. So like it can, like ischemia or that blood in the 
in the uh, cavity can really cause issues. So they can cause seizure disorders due to the ischemia or just the occupying space of that blood that's bleeding within that brain cavity <coughs> in the skull. Some metabolic issues, hypoxia. So remember, give them oxygen, right? Hypoxia, abnormal blood chemical values. These are the ones that we're not gonna know about, but generally, like alcoholics especially, people with kidney disease, dialysis patients, they're gonna have weird blood values that we're not gonna know about pre-hospital, but they can cause seizures that basically are not, uh, are refractory to any of our treatments. So they're gonna just gonna continue to seize until they can get um, those blood values figured out. Hypoglycemia, huge. You see an actively seizing patient, check their blood sugar, just like a stroke. Poisoning, drug overdoses, and alcohol withdrawals. Alcohol withdrawals, you might not think is that big of a deal, but they uh, are very deadly uh, because essentially what alcohol withdrawals cause is an issue with their blood chemical values, and then they just start seizing, and they will seize and seize and seize until everything kind of gets back in order. And even the, the seizure medications that paramedics can give to stop a seizure probably aren't gonna work very well once they start seizing. Does anybody know the time frame of alcohol withdrawals when they're the most prevalent after their drink, last drink? I'd say like 10 minutes, but I don't know. 24 to 72 hours after that last drink, they're most susceptible to alcohol withdrawals. So just something to keep in mind. You'll get that call a lot. Hey, I stopped drinking today. I'm worried about going into withdrawals. First question I say is, how much have you had to drink today? When did you have your last drink? And what's your typical uh, daily drinking habit? Is anybody's car going off right now? It's a uh, Challenger. So we probably try to steal it. Hmm. Try to steal it. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard. And then febrile seizures, more in our pediatric populations. Uh, this is one we'll go on a lot. It comes out as a cardiac arrest all the time. You're like, holy shit, it's like a one-year-old cardiac arrest, right? And then you show up, patients usually crying by the time we get there. Parents have them wrapped up in four blankets, like, oh, they've been sick recently. Uh, which obviously, I don't have kids, but I could understand why that would be so scary for people. A lot of times the baby stops breathing for a minute, it just kind of goes into that tonic activity, and then they're, you know, have a postictal phase for a few minutes and come back. Usually febrile seizures are as one seizure accompanied with that fever. Usually it's, a, it's the spike in temperature. It's not the fever itself. It's a spike in temperature that will cause, it's kind of just like their brain resetting. Um, so very common, but if you show up and they're still actively seizing, they've had more than one seizure, uh, that's when we start to get really concerned if it's something else. Is there anything you can do for your baby? Or just uh, don't wrap them in all the blankets, kind of take them out of like their onesie, uh, something like that. Uh, Tylenol, ibuprofen, stuff to control fever. Yeah. Which most of the time parents are still trying and they'll you know, say, I gave them Tylenol or Motrin last night. And they've, you know, uh, they're really hot today, and so that's kind of, a lot of it comes down to the history as you're kind of talking when you get there. Uh, another one, we don't want to always assume it's a febrile seizure, but I mean, that's nine out of 10 seizure calls if they don't have a seizure history of the, of kids under, especially under three years old, but six and under is kind of the, uh, the age group. They talk about medications they may be on, um, the longer, is anybody interested in going like paramedic, other route besides EMT? I'm thinking about it. So the longer you do this, the longer you're in the field, especially as a paramedic, this is something you need to know for sure, is like as medications patients take. But even as an EMT, uh, it can be super helpful if you have an idea of what medications are, what they do, kind of the generic names, try to learn the generic names, don't try to learn the trade names because you can look at someone's list of medications and say, oh, they're on Depakote and Keppra and they have a Versed prescription. You know, like, oh, well, they obviously have a seizure history and if they're altered mental status and they're not able to tell you their seizure history, knowing their medications can go a really long way in determining kind of your course of treatment. So while they don't expect you at all to know these, it's just a good plug of, hey, it's good to kind of, if you are doing, gonna do this for a while, 
uh, learn those medications. It's not in the ENT scope of practice, but we always preach know above your scope of practice, but work within your scope of practice, if that makes sense. Yeah. So postictal state, after a seizure, the muscles relax, breathing becomes labored sometimes. Uh, may be characterized by hemiparesis. This is this kind of the scary one, if they have that hemiparesis. What is hemiparesis? Paralysis of one side. Paralysis of one side. So they may have that. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come back to normal function pretty quickly, but they may have it. I've honestly only seen it one time in a seizure out of hundreds of seizure patients. Um, this is an NREMT slideshow, so take it for a grain of salt, with a grain of salt. Uh, most commonly characterized by lethargy and confusion. That's what you're going to really see most of the time. They're just really tired. They're confused. They're not really going to be acting appropriately for a few minutes, but they're going to kind of trend towards their baseline after a few minutes. That's the important part to note. They're not going to be getting worse. They're going to be trending towards being more responsive, more with it. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. We're really watching the trend of how they're acting too. If you're not sure if this is postictal or if this is something else, we're going to try to get them going towards the hospital for sure. But if it's a pretty clear cut seizure, they have a history of it, their family knows about it, they saw them seize and they're just postictal, we're probably going to kind of stay in play a little bit and wait it out a bit. Um, if there's no threats to airway, breathing, circulation, right? So. If the patient does not improve, consider other possible underlying conditions. There's also been many a times where I've been like, oh, this is seizure all day. They have a seizure history. This is how they present. And we're sitting there for five minutes, sitting there for 10 minutes. And we're like, okay, they're not getting better. What's going on? So don't just like go down one pathway and then not do anything else, right? And so you know, we check blood sugar, we check vitals, everything's kind of within normal limits. And you take a look at their pupils and one's like five, six millimeters and one's two. You're like, oh wait, this is something else, right? This is probably some sort of brain bleed on top of the seizure activity. So uh, <clears throat> do your full assessment. Don't just assume it's a seizure because they're, they seem postictal, but go through your full uh, neurological assessment, which I think we're gonna, we're gonna go through here next after we get like through syncope. So. Any questions on seizures or strokes before we move on? Okay, so syncope, another super common call. I mean, probably top three or four call types that we're gonna go on is syncopal events. So fainting episodes. Uh, seizures are often mistaken for syncope or fainting. Fainting typically occurs while the patient is standing or when they go to stand up. That's kind of the most common. Has anybody ever fainted before? So I mean, a lot of people, very healthy young people will faint for no obvious reason. It, m the majority of the time, it's not a life-threatening issue, but we still have some digging to do as, to, as why it's happening. So there's no postictal phase. So if they stood up, fell unconscious for a minute and woke right back up, we're thinking syncopal event, not seizure, okay? Even if they have a seizure history, if they, you know, something where they went unconscious pretty suddenly, or we're like sitting there and just the thousand yard stare, went unconscious, wake back up and no postictal phase, we're thinking syncopal event, not seizure, okay? If they wake up, they're confused for a long time, they're really lethargic, that's more postictal, we're thinking more seizure than syncope. Does that make sense, a differentiation between the two? Okay. So postictal state is that phase after a seizure, sometimes up to 30 minutes where they're gonna be confused, lethargic. They may or may not have some deficits, very rarely will have some deficits, but generally they're just gonna be really confused, lethargic overall, maybe even combative. So that's something to be aware of. A lot of weapons, of uh, many a seizure patient where you, you, know, you go to assess them and they have like a knife on them or even a, there was a guy in the Walmart that had a gun on him one time and we didn't know it for like 20 minutes because he didn't think about assessing like a full body assessment. So uh, they're gonna be combative potentially and confused and it's not that they are against you but they just don't necessarily know what they're thinking. And so just something to keep in mind is scene safety. So in those situations, I'll walk in, I'll kind of do a quick scan for any weapons or anything they can go for. And if there's something 
you're not going to walk in and be like, oh, a gun, and then grab it, right? But just be aware of where it's at. And so, uh, or, you know, get PD involved if you're really concerned about those situations. Uh, would you ever just, like, take it out of the holster and set it to the side? Definitely. I've done that before. Um, if they have it on them, that's a little different. Uh, spe oh, okay. Yeah. No, like if they have it in a holster on their body, on their person, then that's a definite situation. I've definitely pulled knives off people uh, or like a gun. I try to pull the whole holster if I can. Some of them are like, you know, different than others. Yeah. So it's just dependent on the situation. Uh, yeah, but usually if there's a police officer there, have them do it, obviously. But if they're not, and many times they're not going to be there for a seizure call, um, that's a definite safety issue that we're going to want to you know, remove that from the situation because if they're combative, violent, and they don't really know what's happening when they wake up, the first thing they're gonna be like, who the f are you? And they're gonna, yeah. Sorry, I'm not supposed to swear. Um, but yeah, so think of your scene safety in these situations as well. <clears throat> altered mental status, so kind of generalized altered mental status where they don't really fit into that stroke category, that, seizure category. This is the other most common neurological emergency. This is probably more common, uh, one of the more common calls that we go on. It's just a generalized altered mental status. They don't know why, there's nothing clear cut. Uh, the patient is just not thinking clearly or is incapable, I don't like that one, incapable of being aroused. They're not, uh, they're just not with it, with their level of consciousness. Uh, in some patients they may be unconscious, but in more, so essentially a patient with a GCS less than 15 is an altered mental status, okay? They're not alert and oriented. Can these patients refuse medical care? Yes. Anyway. Can, they <laughs> can they refuse medical care um, if they have an altered mental status? They cannot refuse our medical care until they are alert and oriented. Does that have to be a GCS of 15 for them to refuse it? Yes. Yeah, so they have to be alert and oriented and able to make those rational medical decisions. I think Wade was talking about how in those situations where they can't decline it because it's lower than 15, he just feels like you're kidnapping yourself. It does. Sometimes it really does. And sometimes you're like, this person probably doesn't know what day of the week it is normally. And we're like taking this little old grandma out of her nursing home because that's the way it is. A lot of times with those situations, at least, is they have a power of attorney. You can call the power of attorney. And this is the stuff you find out in the field is like, we, we teach it one way, but in all reality, we'll call their power of attorney. Hey, they're a little confused. There's nothing life threatening going on right now necessarily. This is what we're seeing. What would you like to do? And generally the, the way I treat it is, and the way I've been asked a lot too, is if it was your grandma or grandpa, what would you want to do? And that's how you should really treat those situations. Uh, is if it was your family member, what would you do? Uh, so. If, if ever at three in the morning, you're like getting really tired of all the BS calls and that kind of thing, and you're at the nursing home for a little old grandma, like just pretend that's your grandma. So it's a good way of kind of recentering kind of the way you're thinking about some stuff. So with altered mental status, let's see. I, there's a acronym that I like to use. And it's A-E-I-O-U TIPS. Has anybody heard of that one before? Yeah. And there's a few different variations of it. So A, alcohol or acidosis. E, epilepsy. I, Insulin, O, overdose, U, uremia, T, trauma, second I, infection, P, for psych, S, stroke, seizure. So I actually still use this 
all the time when I go on calls. Um, this is something that between OPQRST, AEIOU tips, sample, that kind of thing, they, I mean, they sound silly to kind of memorize when you're in EMT school, but those are really good foundations of patient assessments. And so if you can do an OPQRST on somebody, a good sample, along with your primary assessment, and then say an altered mental status, something like AEIOU tips, that can go a really long way in getting a good baseline until you kind of figure out what other questions you should be asking. So how are we going to assess for alcohol? Smell. Smell, alcohol bottles, right? Things like that. Acid. Are they drinking a beer as you walk up? I've had that happen many a times. Uh, acidosis, probably not one we're going to know pre-hospital. It's kind of one of those like by exclusion. <clears throat> but you could, you know, if they have Kuzmol respirations, high blood sugar, things like that. Uh, what about e epilepsy? What are some signs of a seizure? We've talked quite a bit about it today, but what are some signs that maybe we've talked about? Convulsions. Convulsions. Loss of consciousness. Loss of consciousness, seizure history. Uh, if they bite the side of their tongue as opposed to the front, it's pretty specific of a neurological event. So you can have them stick out their tongue and if it's bit on the side, more of, <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing my voice a bit, more of a sign of a neurological event, whereas the front means they probably fell and bit their tongue. And that's actually scientifically proven, like 83% specific if it's the side of their tongue. Eye insulin, how are we going to rule that out really quick and easy? Blood glucose. O, overdose, especially around these parts. I used to work in this district in one of those hotels over there. Uh, you walk in, needles on the floor, needles still in their arm, pills everywhere, uh, pinpoint pupils, not breathing, that kind of thing. Those are kind of your clear cut overdose signs. You, uremia, what's that? Uh, that's. Yeah, high waste, high waste products in your blood. So think of like sepsis, infection, urinary tract infection. And you guys may not know this, but you're going to be very familiar with the smell of a UTI when you walk into a nursing home or somebody's house. It is potent, and you will never not be able to pick up on that smell. You'll walk in, and it's just like super foul urine smell, and you'll know it's a UTI before you even see your patient. So something that you're going to pick up on pretty quick uh, as you get start to do this in the field a lot more. Trauma. Pretty self-explanatory, but uh, you know, say they were in a car accident a few days ago, things that you're gonna look for. You're gonna, th so they talk about raccoon eyes and battle sign, like it's, you're gonna, s I've never seen that in like a patient that it just happened to. It happens hours after a traumatic incident. Um, so these are like a few days down the road, you're gonna look for those raccoon eyes, the battle sign, things like that, signs of trauma, so especially signs of head trauma. Or they're just gonna tell you, yo, yeah, I was in a car accident. Eye for infection. What are we going to look for with signs of an infection? Fever. Fever. What else? Skin color. I feel like. Skin color. What do you think? Like yellowish. I don't know. Yellow could be sign of like liver failure. Yeah. Um, thinking of like ulcers, sores, uh, sources of an infection. If they feel really hot to the touch. Yeah. Um, so generally with an infection, the first few days, they're going to be really feverish, really hot, kind of reddish to the because they're just. Think of it, you're just going through a workout, right? You're, you're having a fever. Uh, and then after a while, they call it cold sepsis, where you get pale, clammy, diaphoretic, low blood pressure, kind of that hypodynamic uh, sepsis. Psych. These are interesting. Uh, a lot of times it's clues, right? Are they acting appropriately? Do they seem, you know, all over the place? Do they tell you they have a history of mental disorders of some sorts? <clears throat> this comes back to kind of the medications. They have medications that are, are for some sort of uh, psychiatric disorder, schizophrenia, things like that. Those are, this is going to be tough sometimes to really determine if it's a psych issue. This should be also kind of by exclusion because a lot of other things, hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia can cause altered mental status. So that's one if you know, you're kind of going through all this and you're like, man, is it psych? Like we have this, this, and this. Not necessarily the one you should jump first to. And then stroke seizure, we kind of beat that one today. But uh, kind of going through your stroke assessment and
stroke assessment and uh, signs of a seizure that we've kind of talked about today. So a stroke assessment, when you walk into the room, what, how am I going to determine this patient's having a stroke? We talked about the signs, right? But what's the assessment called? What, yeah, fast, fast exam. Cincinnati stroke assessment is kind of the most typical one. So like I said, when I walk into the room and I think someone, you know, we're going for like a stroke. Say you're my patient, I'm gonna walk up to you. I'm gonna, as I'm walking up to you, I'm assessing you, right? I'm looking at skin color, temperature, condition, looking at how you're approaching or how you're looking at me as I approach you. And then I'm gonna say, hey, sir, can you look right at me? You can give me a big smile, okay? Now put your arms out like you're holding a pizza box and close your eyes. Hold that for 10 seconds, okay? And then go ahead and open your eyes, put your arms down. Can you repeat a sentence back to me? You can't teach an old dog new tricks. Can't teach an old dog new tricks. Okay, so signs of a stroke. So he did that, you know, he passed that stroke exam. Signs of a stroke, obviously anything. So one side of their face doesn't rise with, like the other does. If their face is drooping at all, definitely a sign of facial droop, right? Speech, if their sentences are jarbled or they're unable to complete that sentence or their speech is slurred, that's gonna be a uh, sign of a stroke. And then as far as that, pro this is called pronator drift, right? So this is, if anything is drifting at all, it could be as obvious as like they can't move one side of their body, but also it could be something just like this. Like they just have weakness or they're unable to hold that arm up at all, that's a sign of pronator drift. And anything that they fail in that pre-hospital stroke exam, we're gonna treat it like a stroke, okay? And so once we, I think this is gonna be next here. Once we determine they are having a stroke, oh, okay, so they're gonna make us go through like, we've kind of gone through the scene size up, but uh, we'll kind of keep on this tangent. Once you just determine that they are having a stroke, what is vitally important for anybody that's read the book? So I'm looking at one person right now. What do we need to know about that patient? Time. So that fast exam, time. What do they mean by time? When did it happen? Last known well. So like <laughs> when was the last time that patient was... Oh, what the hell? <coughs> When was the last time that patient was acting appropriately without stroke-like symptoms? That can be really easy to determine sometimes. It can be really hard to determine. We need to be uh, kind of like detectives in this situation and be really nosy and almost very upfront with family or the patient to determine the last known well. Because a lot of times they don't understand how important that is, but it is vitally important for the treatment of that patient for the hospital treatment of TPA or those blood clot, uh, those blood uh, clot busting drugs that they're going to get in the hospital. So at the, you know, you can say, "Hey, when was the last time they were acting normal?" Like, "Oh, I don't know, a few hours, I guess, maybe yesterday." Maybe it's like, "No, okay, were they acting appropriately at lunch today? Were they acting appropriately at breakfast this morning? And if they were still acting appropriately then, or, or uh, they were still having issues then?" How were they when they went to bed last night, okay? Uh, how were they when they ate dinner last night? We really wanna narrow it down as much as possible. They've, we've even gone through people's phones to determine like, hey, did they make a phone call? We're not like searching through you know, everything. We're just trying to determine like, did they make a phone call at any point? Did they send a text message that made sense you know, an hour ago or four hours ago? Um, did they get up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night? So here's kind of a couple examples. Uh, that can be kind of confusing. Generally, if they're like, yeah, at nine o'clock, I saw his face start to droop and he was acting weird, right? That's your last known well is nine o'clock. But if it's, say, 8 a.m., you're just starting your shift, you go for a stroke call, and you're asking them, hey, when did this all happen? Well, he woke up like this. What's his last known normal? When he went to bed, right? Did he, was he normal when he went to bed? Yes, what time did you go to bed? 11 p.m. Last known well is 11 p.m. Okay, so that's called a wake up stroke. Uh, it's very common. Um, so our last known well would be when they went to bed or hey, did they get up in the middle of the night and act, were they acting appropriately in the middle of the night? Yes, at 4 a.m. he got up 
he, you know, a lot of times I'll hear like, yeah, he got up at, no at midnight when he normally does to go to the bathroom. Everything seemed fine. At 4 a.m., he was seen to be struggling to get up to go to the bathroom, which was kind of odd. And I woke up to find him rolled out of bed this morning, unable to get up. That's like a really common kind of scenario. And so his last known well would be at midnight when he got up to go to the bathroom. Um, and again, being very like to the point, hey, we need to know exactly when this person started acting inappropriately. They had one, I it might have been with Wade. Uh, it was a few years ago. We had a guy that was like 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock in the morning, go for a stroke. He woke up like that. The wife, I'm like, hey, when was the last time you saw Jerry acting, uh, acting normally? <laughs> she goes, oh, he's kind of an odd guy. Um, it's been a few years, I'd say. And I'm like, no, like I need to know when like this started to happen. He's like, oh, I don't know, okay. And it took like 20 minutes, I swear, to figure out that one last known well for him. But uh, really trying to narrow down that last known well is very important. And what, what vital sign do we need on top of our normal vital signs? Blood sugar, okay, get a blood sugar early. So scene size up, you all know the scene size up. This is not any different. I guess you might not. You guys have gone through the trauma and the medical sheets a little bit. So this isn't gonna be anything different than your national registry sheets. Primary assessment, this doesn't change from chapter to chapter. You'll kind of notice the primary assessment essentially always stays the same. Treating your ABCs. <laughs> Treating the ABCs, XABCs, you know, exsanguination, if that, I don't know what's happening. Uh, XABCs, so exsanguination, airway, breathing, circulation. With your hemorrhagic stroke patients, you may very well have to walk in, open the airway, suction, keep that airway open. Um, that's one of those that can be very common to have to manage an airway in a medical scenario very quickly. Uh, so really keep on top of the airway portion of your neurological emergencies because they can deteriorate very quickly. And stroke patients, a lot of times, can't swallow. So they're not gonna be able to handle their secretions very well. And so that's actually something I assess pretty early at the paramedic level because we can intubate patients. So if they can't swallow and I feel like they're unable to kind of handle their secretions, then I'm gonna probably perform an advanced airway early rather than often or give a medication that will keep them from vomiting uh, early rather than after they vomit. So something to keep in mind um, is their airway and stroke seizure type patients. History taking, again, this doesn't really change. It's sample history, which we all know. Uh, using clues, which is really important with our altered mental status. I'm really nosy when I go on calls. <clears throat> I'm like looking around their living room and looking around, you know, for, I can't tell you how many times where I walked in an altered mental status patient and they're like, oh, they don't drink alcohol. And I'm like, what's this can full of beer bottles right here? And like, oh, he told us he stopped drinking or you know, something like that or drug use, anything like that. I always joke, have you ever seen the movie, the show House, where it's like everybody's high, everybody's drunk. It's, it's kind of that scenario. It's, that's a very jaded way to look at it, but you're gonna have to keep it in the back of your mind. People aren't always gonna be super truthful. They're not, they're just worried they're gonna get in trouble. So do your own kind of digging on scene uh, be kind of your own detective on what you're gonna on what you're finding and, and compare it to the history that you're getting from a patient or family member. They just may not know that you know if it's a patient that is hiding something from them. Secondary assessment. Uh, you know they're talking about the Cushing's triad with the vital signs specifically. So if you're seeing signs of that, or it's you know maybe they were normal, but then you're doing your reassessment and you're seeing their blood pressure is climbing up and up and up, then we're we're not trending the right way. There's not a whole lot we're gonna do about that pre-hospital, but it's just something to keep in mind of some of those changes. <coughs> I don't care about the Los Angeles pre-hospital stroke screen, or you'll hear the NH NIH score in the hospital. It's like some crazy test that takes like 10 minutes to perform. I have to know it because of my job, but uh, it is the, it's stupid. Uh, it just takes forever. What you guys need to be worried about is that FAST mnemonic or the Cincinnati pre-hospital stroke scale, which we just went over. Yeah, don't worry about that one. That's the one we went over. That's, yeah, there's all the different ones. Don't worry about those. And then try to get a GCS score if you can. Um, just, it's, it's good for charting and documentation purposes. 
to be able to say, hey, they were at GCS of 15 when we got there, they're now at GCS of 10, and then now, you know, when they're at the hospital, they can make, oh, their GCS is now six, or now it's 14, or whatever. Like, it's more for documentation than anything. It's not super helpful during the call, but good for documentation. Reassessment, nothing's really changing. Uh, reassessing ABCs, vital signs, interventions, compare your baseline findings, uh, watch for changes in their pulse, blood pressure, respirations, that's really important on our neuro stroke patients. And then notify the receiving pa facility of patient's chief complaint and assessment findings. As soon as you know there's, you're having, this patient's having a stroke, send a stroke alert to the hospital. A lot of times I'm calling the hospital when I'm still in the patient's house with an initial, hey, we have a code stroke, code CVA, whatever your local protocols state. We have this patient with these vitals, this blood sugar, and the last known well of this. I'll give you an update when we're en route to the hospital. And then we get them moving, get them out to the ambulance, start moving towards the hospital, IVs, all that kind of good stuff. And then I'll give them another heads up of, hey, we have an ETA of 10 minutes or 15 minutes. So I'll give them an initial notification of a code stroke and then my normal pre-hospital radio report, which you guys probably haven't practiced too much yet, but you will. We've heard about them, but not just yeah. basic. Yeah, it's, it's super basic, but it should take less than 30 seconds, but you guys will go over that with your, uh, when you get into medical scenarios a little bit more. <clears throat> when they get to the hospital, they're gonna get a CT scan of the head uh, to see if there's any bleeding and then they were also kind of do some imaging to see, you know, I said a blood clot, where's the blood clot at, what's affected, what's bleeding, if anything. Um, so they really need to know the last time, the last known well of the patient to know if they can or can't administer certain medications. This is probably one of the one times hospital really, really, really relies on EMTs and paramedics is the last known well. They're really gonna rely on us on this. So we need to be very accurate. It's super important to be accurate on the last known well. Uh, so very important to get that as best as you can. So generally, <clears throat> for a patient's having a seizure, um, I'm gonna keep them probably on their side if they have that altered level of consciousness or altered mental status. If they actively start seizing, really all we're doing is you know put a pillow under their head, try to keep them from hit hurting themselves anymore. I'm gonna put a nasal cannula on them and just turn that up six, eight, 10, 12 liters per minute. I know, you know, National Registry, that's not what you're supposed to do, but uh, that's probably what I'm gonna do in the field. Um, they can certainly take that much oxygen if they need more than the six liters per minute, which is what your book will say, but I'll turn them up to 15 quite often uh, just to give them that blast of oxygen without something covering their mouth in case they do vomit or um, kind of spit up so that we can manage their airway that much quicker. We don't have to take that oxygen off. We can just manage them with a suction catheter if we need to. In a scenario, put on an honor breather for national registry, uh, suction as needed. But in all reality, yeah, nasal cannula, most likely I'd say 95% of the time, I'm gonna have a suction catheter ready, uh, a Yankauer or a Ducanto suction catheter. I'm gonna suction, try not to put anything in their teeth because they're just going to bite it down and they're going to either break their teeth, they're going to break that off in their mouth, and then you have a whole other set of issues. So you're suctioning on the sides of their mouth if you can, trying to get as much of, if they're vomiting, especially out. Um, so maintain a clear airway by suctioning, positioning, and then uh, strap them down well on your bed. Take a couple people with you if you can to keep yourself safe and to keep them safe if they start seizing again and just give them oxygen on the way into the hospital and then make sure you're checking vitals, blood sugar, and uh, doing your, you know, kind of your neuro assessment, checking their pupils, checking for trauma, doing kind of our, you know, our normal assessment that we should be doing on essentially every patient. If neck or head trauma is suspected, put a C collar on them. Uh, National Registry, they love C collars, they love immobilization. There's a lot of research that Definitely full spinal mobilization is gone. That's been gone for 10 years. Um, but even C collars, I imagine over the next few years, they're gonna become kind of a thing of the past. Uh, we're gonna put them on maybe major traumas and that's it. Uh, but for the most part, it's something to consider, but National Registry put a C collar on if they fell, okay? Uh, but you may see it in the field, they may not put the C collar on. Don't be like, wow, that paramedic 
sucks. They didn't put a C collar on that patient, right? So just know there's a lot of different things in the field you'll see compared to kind of the national registry. <clears throat> so for patients who are continuing to have a seizure, say you show up and they're still actively seizing. Uh, like I said, I kind of like to work in between the seizures, put on the oxygen early. That's why I like the nasal cannula too, because they're not going to knock it off their faces easily. So put on that oxygen, try to keep things away from them, put a pillow under their head or something around them, some padding. If you're in a house, let them kind of seize. It sounds weird, but let them seize. Um, if they're at any point, their uh, respirations become inadequate, we need to start ventilate them, ventilating them with the BBM. But for the most part, it's just gonna be supplemental oxygen. When they stop seizing, we're gonna clear, I mean, try to clear their airway as best we can. If they do start vomiting, that's the type of stuff we need to jump in, even if they're actively seizing. Try to suction as best you can. It's not gonna work very well, but you can try. And then when they stop seizing, that's when we're gonna move them. That's when we're gonna take vitals. That's when we're gonna you know, start IVs if we're gonna start IVs. Uh, so we're really gonna work in between those seizures and then move them to the ambulance where we can really work. And then rendezvous with ALS if possible. For headaches, generally, unless they are like that sudden onset severe headaches, really all we're doing is assessing them for a stroke and taking them into the hospital if we see signs of a stroke. Uh, for the most part, we're not gonna do a whole lot about just a, a simple headache. Um, but we can take them in and monitor their vitals if that's the case. And then stroke, ABCs, SpO2 to maintain that 94%. Um, we want them 94 to 99. We don't want them at 100%. So uh, 94 to 99 is really ideal. But unless they're, yeah, unless they're in respiratory distress or they're hypoxic, there's, you know, there's no real need to throw everybody on oxygen. There's been a lot of studies that have shown, it used to be non breather for every patient, right? <clears throat> but uh, you know, really, unless they're in respiratory distress or they're hypoxic, there's really no need to throw them on oxygen. And if possible, transport to a designated stroke center. Um, here, St. Luke's downtown, St. Alphonsus on Curtis and St. Luke's in Meridian are stroke centers. So we can take our strokes to any of those centers. The other ones will just transfer them out. And St. Al's on Garrity. Talked about seizures. Uh, if they do refuse transport after a seizure, depending on where you work, you have to contact medical control. Locally, you don't have to. Uh, but I'm sure Wade's talked a bit about refusals. It's kind of our, you know, make, that, make sure it's an informed refusal. Offer them transport. Tell them the risks of the refusal and why they should go tell them the signs and symptoms to watch out for, have them repeat the risks of refusal and things to watch out for back to you to show that they understand and then document all that appropriately after you offer them a ride again. Uh, so that's kind of the way I handle refusals. Um, but sometimes you do have to contact medical control for every th refusal, but here they allow us to kind of work pretty freely um, as long as we don't fuck it up too many times. Alter mental status, determine the cause, AE, IOU tips. If, it, if you think it's trauma, C-spine, uh, or a C collar, sorry. ABCs, transport to the appropriate, very simple. All this is super simple, right? It's really just ABCs and a good assessment. And the assessment depends, changes every chapter. But for the most part, treatment doesn't change that much. We're supporting ABCs. We're uh, doing a good history, a good secondary assessment and then trying to mostly determine what's going on and trying to in respond to things appropriately. Mm -hmm.